Good morning, good morning, good morning. Glad you're here this morning. To those joining us online this morning, we welcome you. Those watching in our cafe this morning, because when you came in, you couldn't find any seats. Thank you for being flexible with us. We're glad that you're, you stayed with us uh, this morning. Happy Mother's Day to our moms, a day when we celebrate uh, those moms, those spiritual mothers that have nurtured us, that have guided us, that have hel- helped us in this life. We're grateful uh, for you. Uh, whether it's through biology, adoption, step-parenting, uh, being a supportive family member, being a spiritual mentor in someone's life, we're thankful for all those who've been spiritual mothers. And we also understand here at Pioneer Drive today can be a challenging day. It might be your first Mother's Day without uh, your mother. It might be uh, that you had a mother that was less than ideal. It may be that you wish to be a mother, and we have prayed for you as well. We know that with great joy can also be great sorrow for for some, and so we want to pray with you, and, and we have done so uh, this morning. But we do have a gift for all of our, our moms, our spiritual mothers out at the Welcome Center after the service. Stop by and get that. First come, first serve. Uh, we may run out today, but uh, we have thought about you, and I hope you take that uh, to, to know that you mean a lot. Uh, this morning, we are continuing our sermon series, Shadows of Doubt. Now, we started this two weeks ago, and this is one of those series that you can go online, watch us, pioneerdrive.org, I would encourage you, especially if what we're talking about, you're like, well, I wonder where they're going, or I wonder where they've been. Uh, just jump, it's kind of like jumping in the middle of a conversation. Now, all of these, if you've missed the last couple, you're going to get, I hope, a lot out of this, but I can't cover everything in 30 minutes, okay? So I would encourage you to, to look back as you uh, also look forward if you're not going to be with us in the days to come. But just to catch you up really quick, in week one, we discussed that God's people are a people who wrestle. God's people are a people Uh, who literally, Israel's name, they wrestle with or contend with God. Uh, Last week we discussed that God is a relational God, God is a covenantal God, that God establishes covenants with people, and with that comes the desire that God has for us to be faithful to God in that covenant, that that faith in God is not simply a contract, it is so much more, it is a covenant. So this week we're going to look at a faith that is built on Christ. I want to start by reading in John chapter 17. This is just kind of the foundation for us as we begin this conversation today. I want to make sure we've got the foundation here. Uh, Jesus uh, talking, Jesus praying. In John chapter 17, beginning in verse 25, Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I myself may be in them. So as Jesus is praying a very intimate prayer uh, for all believers, he's praying that they would understand the love of God. The love of God that has been revealed, and in this text they're looking forward, that will be revealed on the cross of Christ Jesus. That God loves us. And so this conversation is rooted in in, in a faith that is God-honoring and Christ-seeking. Now, as a pastor, there are honest questions that I get. And you'd be surprised, may not be, but you might be surprised at how often I get these questions. Questions like, do my doubts disqualify me from salvation? Questions like, are my doubts about God's willingness to heal my child the reason he or she is not healed? Maybe Mother's Day, maybe some of our our moms can can relate to this. Maybe some of our children can relate to this if they've said goodbye to a mother too soon. Other questions like, how much faith do I need to get God to change the heart of my spouse? Or questions like, I struggle with the idea that God really cares about my family and, and me. Do you think that's why I can't find a job? Maybe these are questions you've asked before. Maybe it's questions you're asking today. But questions like these are important questions. They're honest questions. They're personal questions. They're real questions that we have, aren't they? And for some of us, we feel like the answer to these questions and and how much faith we have depends on what kind of standing we are. You see, questions such as these are often predicated on the assumption that our faith is as strong as it is certain. And the more certain that we are, the more God will be involved in our lives. And so that common view is that struggling faith is weak, questioning, unquestioning faith, excuse me, 
is strong. Now, we're diving into the deep waters this morning. That's just what we do at the gathering. We're honest. We walk through the scriptures honestly together. That's, that's just how we do things. And so it, 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 we're not going to go forever, I promise. But I want you to hang with me. Uh, think about this for a moment. You ever been, uh, I, recently I saw a fair here in town, and I know a fair is coming in September, and, and usually at the fair they have this game, the strength tester game. And it's usually they have the ability to test your strength, and there's some kind of bell at the top of a pole, and it's got some kind of metal puck, and you take a mallet, and you swing it, and you try to hit that metal puck, and as hard as you can hit it, your, your goal is to try to ring the bell. Strength tester. And that's a fair analogy for how a lot of folks think about faith. We, we assume our faith is as strong as we are psychologically certain. Faith is often associated with certainty. Think about it. If the view of our faith, if the strength view of our faith is measured by the intensity of your psychological certainty, then the way to increase your faith is to try to push doubt aside in order to make yourself certain. It's a psychological version of the strength tester game. You are, in essence, trying to hit a faith mallet as hard as you can in order to send the faith puck up the faith pole to get as close to the certainty bell as you possibly can. In strength tester faith, faith is only as strong as it is certain. And so for many, we have this certainty-seeking model of faith. The closer to the certainty bell you send the faith puck, the prevailing assumption goes, the greater blessing that you are going to receive from God. And so it encourages us to push away questions, questions that may prevent us from learning or growing in our relationship with God. And you can turn to the Bible and pick out verses that need to be interpreted and not interpret them, verses like Matthew 21, 22, where Jesus says, if you believe, you will receive whatever asked for in prayer. We can read a verse like that. We're going to explain that more in a couple of weeks and walk through some of these passages. But a lot of times we'll read these, these passages to assume that our faith is predicated on our certainty. And think about it for a minute. The fact that we still don't have peace in the Middle East can only believe, if you just take this verse without studying it and diving into it, it can only mean that no one has yet to believe strongly enough. You see what I'm saying? You see what I'm getting at here? That faith is only as strong as it is certain. If God interacts with our life to the degree that we make ourselves certain, shouldn't we then find people of faith generally healthier, wealthier, and safer than unbelievers? I know there's a whole stream of thinking and theology out there that I strongly disagree with in the prosperity gospel that claims this, but, but what can happen is that this certainty-seeking faith can become an idol that blocks us from getting life in Christ, even when what we believe is completely true. This happens whenever we're confident we're okay with God because of what we believe rather than because of our relationship with the one true source of life. If what makes us feel okay with God is confidence in the correctness of our beliefs, rather than who our beliefs are about, which is God, those beliefs are going to give us a false sense of life. And so the problem here is that we create these idols. We create these idols in our own image. Anything we try to, to use to fill what only God can fill, which means it replaces God. For a lot of us, our beliefs and our certainty about those beliefs become this idol that becomes this sacred cow that we can't question. And so when our beliefs cannot be challenged, when we say, I, I know everything there is to know about everything, we are in essence saying, I am God. And that's a problem. These, these beliefs become these idols. And, when, and here's what happens. When they're questioned, the faith falls. And so for some, they have all these different beliefs lined out, and they kind of make up that house of cards that we've been using as an analogy. And if you've ever tried to build a house out of cards, you know that you can get, you know, you stack two cards up, put a roof on it. I might be able to get there. I might be able to add a second level to that. But then as soon as any kind of vibration or breath comes, that house falls down. And that, that's the heart of the series. As we're going through it, this is your first time with us. The heart is not to tear a bunch of stuff down. The heart is to build up a faith that lasts because so many people ha have these set of beliefs that they, oh, well, it's all this way. It's all this way. And then they go out and get it questioned. And one question shatters the entire house of cards. Or one question leads them to be very unloving 
towards people who might question or challenge. You know, several years ago, I was talking with someone, and, and, and we were just, it, was, it started out as just a really good conversation, dialogue. They were trying to convince me their position was right. I, of course, was uh, asking them some questions and, and pushing back, and it really was good. And, and finally, after a while, this person started to get a bit agitated with me. And, and they said, finally just said, who, who are you to question God? And my response to them was, I'm not questioning God. I'm questioning your beliefs and my beliefs about God. And those are totally separate issues. Questioning God has the potential to destroy faith. But questioning our beliefs about God has this incredible opportunity to enrich our faith. And so some folks line up all their different beliefs. And if one of them gets questioned or challenged or refuted, then the whole house of cards fall. But you see, to ask questions and to wrestle, then the name of the people of God, the people of Israel, it, throughout Scripture, the Creator God is seen as giving us our minds. I want you to go here if, you're, if your mind's a little bit kind of on high alert right now, like what in the world is this the guy talking about? Look at Isaiah 118. Come now, God speaking, let us reason together, the Lord says to the Israelites. He says, present your case. Elsewhere, he says, set forth your arguments. The creator of the mind has given us a mind, and he clearly expects us to use that mind and to engage that mind. That Throughout scripture, we see passages where people are, are told and encouraged to seek wisdom. You need wisdom when you don't know the only answer that's out there. You need wisdom to make a wise choice. People are encouraged to search for truth, to rationally consider matters. Luke says that Jesus came along understanding this, and he gave, after the resurrection, he gave many convincing proofs that, in fact, he had risen from the dead in Acts chapter 1. You see, I don't believe that God expects people to embrace beliefs without sufficient reason or try to convince themselves of things beyond what the evidence warrants. Jesus frequently was telling people, search this out. Discover it for yourself. Bring it before God. He said in, in Matthew chapter 7, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened. In Mark chapter 4, consider carefully what you hear. In Luke 8, consider carefully how you listen. In Luke 14, he tells a parable about, uh, suppose you want to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? You see, Jesus told these challenging parables, and it required people to engage their mind, to think about it, to think critically about it. None of it sounds like a call for God's people just to simply try to dumb things down, to shut off the critical part of our brain that God gave us, and try to convince ourselves of what may or may not be true. God gave us a mind. God expects us to use that mind, to present the case, to set forth our arguments. And he invites us to trust him in covenantal faith. You know, in every area of our life, we have to do this where we don't know everything, but we still have to choose a course of action. And so this isn't saying that we just need to live in a perpetual state of doubt or question but in every area of our life, we have to choose a course of action, don't we? Think, think about it. You board an airplane. I enjoy uh, flying. I enjoy being able to get away. Sometimes I feel like I'm just above the problems. and just away. I love to fly. And when you get on that plane, you're exercising faith in several things. Physics is going to play out like physics always has played out. Okay? You're going to make an assumption, um, exercise faith, that the pilots aren't drunk. I hope. You're going to exercise faith that the mechanics have done their job and that one of them didn't show up with a bad day at work one day and decided to do something malicious to the plane. You're, you're, make, you're exercising faith that a terrorist isn't on board that plane with intent to harm. Now, you can't be certain of any of that when you get on that plane. But given the fact that flight travel is usually safe, you can act on the fact that the plane is safe. You know, in the Bible, there's a, a man named Job, and this, this man named Job loses everything. And his friends are all trying to figure out why. And they, they come to the conclusion that Job sinned. Now, that was untrue. And they were chastised precisely because they tried to remain certain about their beliefs in the face of evidence against those beliefs. 
God has given us a mind to think, to rationalize. God clearly expects us to use it. Go back and look at John chapter 17. Jesus, about to head to the cross, praying for believers. Righteous Father, though the world does not know you, I know you, and they know that you have sent me. I have made you known to them and will continue to make you known in order that the love you have for me may be in them and that I may, myself may be in them. You see, when you look at the witness of Jesus in the scripture, he came to, to testify to the truth, to point people to God. And, and so the faith that we have as Christians is a Christ-seeking faith. That, that God's ultimate goal in creation is nothing less than for the very same perfect love that the Father has for his own Son to be given to us and to be placed in us. That only God can satisfy our longing for perfect, unconditional love, unsurpassable worth, absolute security. And so the most important aspect of our inner longing is the need to experience God's perfect, unconditional love. A central aspect of what this means is that we long to know in an experiential way that we have unlimited or unsurpassable worth to God and that we are absolutely secure in this love and worth. And so faith is a relationship that we have with God even in the midst of uncertainty, not because of certainty. And so more than certainty seeking or strength finder or, or, or strength tester faith, what we seek as Christian faith it's Christ. Faith that is built on the rock is Christ-seeking, not certainty-seeking. There are simply things we do not know, and so we have to hold what we believe about what we do not know with humility and with love. It was Paul who said in 1 Corinthians 13, I want you to hear this. This is the love chapter. We read, early of, early, read a lot of it earlier, but I want you to hear this part because we often don't read this part. He says in verse 12, 1 Corinthians 13, for now, this is in the Bible, okay? It's there. For now we see only a reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now Paul saying this, I know in part. Then I shall know fully, even as I am fully known. Did you catch that? And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Paul is saying, you're not going to be certain about everything. No. We know in part. That's right. Amen. <laughs> but we live out our faith, our confidence in God, with faith, with hope, and with love. And with love. And so many of us think in terms of our faith, in terms of certainty, but faith is precisely for uncertainty. If you know in full, you don't need faith. A Christ-seeking model of faith is rooted in God's love. Paul would say in Romans chapter 5, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. We look to the cross as Christians to see the fullness of God's love that's been demonstrated. And in order to experience that full life, it was Paul elsewhere who said of all the things that we could go into, of all the different theological disputes, of all the different cultural and political issues of our day, when Paul came to the church at Corinth, he said, For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. For Paul, that was enough, and for me, that's enough. We can look nowhere else to Jesus than him crucified. Our foundation is Christ Jesus, that Jesus reveals to us who God really is. And this Christ-seeking model of faith understands this, that the Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. And so a Christ-seeking faith is rooted in God's love. It understands the cross reveals God's love demonstrated, and it understands Jesus reveals God to us. And so just like in a marriage where we aren't certain about everything about our spouse, but we're confident enough to make a long-term commitment to each other. It's not about striving for certainty. It's about a willingness to commit in the face of uncertainty. And so the point right now, however, is that although we had to be confident enough about our beliefs to commit to each other, our focus in marriage wasn't on the beliefs we had about each other. It was on the person our beliefs were about. It's all about Jesus. 
Christianity will absolutely stand up to critical scrutiny. And so this is not an argument to bury our heads in the sand or or to be defenseless against others who want to tear the faith down. But winning arguments and providing certainty wasn't what Jesus came to do. John 10.10, he came what? To have life and have it to the full. John 3.16, he came because God so loved the world that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. An invitation to faith that the world would know we're his followers, not by how many arguments we win, but in John 13, by the way we choose to love one another. This is the ultimate purpose of the scripture and holding all these beliefs is to help us sustain a relationship with God through Christ Jesus, our source of life. And so strength finder or strength tester or certainty seeking faith is as strong as a person is certain. But Christ seeking faith is as strong as a love that's been revealed in Christ Jesus. Strength finder faith, strength tester faith depends on my beliefs and my certainty about those beliefs. Christ seeking faith depends on God. And the love that God has for us that doesn't depend on me. You know, when I'm confident that God unconditionally loves me because of what he did for me on the cross, then wouldn't I believe that God's love for me does not increase or decrease based on how accurate or inaccurate my other beliefs are? So if I'm confident that God ascribes this unsurpassable worth to me on the basis of Calvary that we read in Romans chapter 5, wouldn't I be confident that my worth isn't increased simply because I hold correct beliefs and it can't be decreased because I hold mistaken beliefs? I'm not saying we need to just go out and hold wrong beliefs for the sake of holding wrong beliefs. But man, some folks have a weight on them. And that weight is crushing because I think they got to have it all figured out. And that weight is paralyzing because until they have it all figured out, they don't do anything with it. Jesus invites us into faith. There was a theologian, Clark Pinnock, who said, theological reflection is a pilgrimage in which change should be celebrated, not feared. For it's the questions that we have, the wrestling that God's people do, that we discover the all-important center of the Christian faith is not me, It's not what's in my mind. It's the person of Christ Jesus with whom we are invited to have a lifelong, eternal relationship with. And so a faith that lasts is a faith that is built on that rock. And so if we view our faith in terms of Christ-seeking and not certainty-seeking, we'll understand that just because we have questions or uncertainty or get frustrated, our true faith is a commitment to trust Jesus in the face of uncertainty, that Jesus is trustworthy. So Christ-seeking faith is rooted in God's gracious love that's been revealed to us in Christ Jesus. He is the image of the invisible God. Strength finder faith, strength tester faith is as strong as we are certain. Christ-seeking faith is as strong as God's love that's been revealed in Christ Jesus. And so church, my prayer for us is that we press in to this Jesus, that we particularly press into Jesus who said he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. He's the one that offers us this whole faith dynamic, this whole faith relationship. And he wants us to use our mind and to engage our mind and to follow him into all these different spaces where we go. He wants us to have a relationship with him, to pray, to trust, to love. You're not God, I'm not God. That's not in my job description to have it all figured out. Ask the questions. We know in part. But whatever you choose to do, faith, hope, and love remain. And the greatest of these is love. It's been revealed in Christ Jesus. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, I'm thankful for your word that challenges us, that that causes us to think. And and the, the reality is we all come with questions and maybe frustrations, maybe anger. out some of us have shoved that away built built fences around those beliefs and said no questioning welcome others of us just aren't sure of what way to go I pray that wherever we are today God we see that love that's been revealed in Christ Jesus a God who came to love a 
God who came to love. And that we root ourselves in that story, particularly in that story, that reality. And so we say thank you for loving us, for dying for us, for giving us new life in you. And I just pray that we are thankful and rejoice that our our faith, our salvation doesn't depend on us or how certain we are. It's you and what you've already done and the reality that we're invited to live into today. It's in the name of Jesus that we offer our prayer. Amen.